In this video, we'll be talking about the enzymes which are frequently used in recombinant DNA technology. So what comes in your mind when you hear the term recombinant DNA technology? Definitely cutting and pasting the DNA, having plasmids, changing the chromosome sequence, gene sequence, etc. Right? And all of these things that we talked about requires enzymes like which are scissors or enzymes which are like glues, etc. Right? So in this video, we would talk about several such enzymes which are absolutely essential for the recombinant DNA technology. And these enzymes that we are going to talk about today are day-to-day -day used in a molecular biology lab and are super important for molecular biology and biotechnology. We are going to talk about restriction endonuclease, T4 DNA ligase, clinofragment, alkaline phosphatase, reverse transcriptase, and also micrococcal nuclease, RNAs A, DNAs 1, and RNAs H. So all of these enzymes we are going to learn about in this particular video. So stay tuned at the end of this video. It's a quick bird's eye view to all of these enzymes. First, let's talk about the restriction endonuclease enzymes. If you remember the workflow of cloning, first we have to restriction digest our vector or the plasmid. So the restriction in the nucleus would work like a molecular scissor, right? Then our gene of interest is also cleaved with the same restriction enzyme, followed by a ligation step, and then it is transformed into the bacteria. As the bacteria grow, our gene of interest also grows with them. That is why restriction in the nucleus could be considered as the molecular scissor, which would be used to cut a particular segment of DNA specifically. Now, why the hell? the restriction enzymes were isolated from bacteria. Why do the bacteria even need the restriction endonuclease machinery, right? If it has to cleave the DNA. So scientists really scratch their heads for a long time. Later they figure out that the restriction enzymes give the bacteria like E. coli a protection against fudge infections. Now fudge are the biggest enemies for the bacteria. Restriction endonuclease can recognize fudge DNA and selectively cut them and destroy them. But it does not recognize its own DNA and cut it because E. coli's own DNA is methylated at specific residues, which prevent the restriction endonuclease enzyme to engage to its own DNA and cleave it. And that is how this sophisticated machinery came into the light of molecular biology and it is now utilized to cut the gene of our own interest. So there are several type of restriction, restriction endonuclease enzymes that are now discovered. Among them, the type 2 restriction endonuclease are the most important. ECOR1, BAMH1, HIN3, these are the type 2 restriction endonuclease. Now these type 2 endonuclease are so important in case of biotechnology because they really have a specific recognition site so they don't cut non-specifically other two restriction endonuclease type type 1 and type 3 they do cut dna but cut at a random site from a random place near a recognition site so they are not so specific for our purposes in terms of recombinant dna technology type 2 restriction in enzymes are of our interest now restriction enzymes can cut and have different restriction patterns it can produce a sticky end which has like overhangs, which are easy to ligate. And there are blunt ends, which do, doesn't have any overhang. Now, next thing that we are going to talk about, let's say after the restriction, which logically comes is ligation. So the ligation enzyme is generally isolated from T4 fudge and it is called T4 DNA ligase. T4 DNA ligase, with the help of ATP, DNTPs and magnesium ion, it can ligate the broken DNA or ligate to uh, the vector with the insert and that is how the DNA ligase work. So DNA ligase actually forms the phosphodiester bond between the juxtaposed 5 prime phosphate of one strand to the 3 prime hydroxyl terminus of another strand. That is how the phosphodiester, last phosphodiester bond is created by DNA ligase. Now it is used in molecular biology heavily for cloning 
But at the same time, we have to understand in molecular biology itself, in the replication process, cells use ligase to repair the Okazaki fragments. Remember, right? Now we move quickly to a version of DNA polymerase, which is known as DNA polymerase clinofragment. DNA polymerase clinofragment is a big fragment of the DNA polymerase one, a chunk of the DNA polymerase one. Now, if we compare DNA polymerase one, the entire DNA polymerase one, and the clinofragment, the thing that clinofragment doesn't have it's the exonuclease activity in the forward direction that means 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity is pretty pro problematic and that's why it is not appropriate for cloning and that's why in order to get rid of that they generated dna polymerase 1 which is devoid of this forward exonuclease activity and that is now known as clinofragment clinofragment has several different usage in molecular biology First and foremost, it is used to prepare radioactive DNA probes. Otherwise, it is super important in terms of blunt end cloning. Filling the three prime ends or blunting the five prime overhangs, it is super important. So let's look at it quickly. So let's say we have a vector, cloning vector, which has a blunt end. So we need a blunt end insert as well, because otherwise if the insert is sticky end, it won't like it nicely. So but the problem is the insert that we have is basically having a sticky end so we need to blunt it somehow before we can clone or before we can do the ligation reaction so how do we blunt it now there could be two type of overhang a three prime overhang at the three prime site or a five prime overhang in both the cases the dna polymer is one clinofragment would perform its job now what would happen is it would bind to the three prime overhangs and with its five prime with its three prime to five prime exonuclease activity it would resect the ends or otherwise it can bind with the five prime overhang and then with its five prime to three prime polymerase activity fill the ends both the cases it would create blunt ends and this blunt end can nicely be cloned into the bl blunt end cloning vector and that can be transformed in with normal protocol to get recombinant colonies next we talk about alkaline phosphatase and polynucleotide kinase both these enzymes are used in a combination and both these enzymes are super important component of a day-to-day -day research in molecular biology as the name suggests one enzyme is a kinase type enzyme which helps in phosphorylation and another is a phosphatase enzyme which helps in dephosphorylation. So let's see how these two opposing acting enzymes can be useful for molecular biology. So imagine this is a plasmid and you restriction digest the plasmid and after that what happens uh, you have the plasmid uh, in a restricted format but there in the ends there are phosphate groups right. It can always re-ligate to each other and that's a big problem. You don't get recombinants instead you get re-ligated products. But if you use the enzyme alkaline phosphatase to chop off the phosphate from the 5 prime ends, what you would have right now is only hydroxyl at the end. Now with only hydroxyl at the end, it cannot re-ligate, which is good, right? That means only recombinant would be produced or the probability of recombinant is increased. Now let's say you have a PCR product. So from one particular region, you have amplified it, but the ends doesn't have a phosphate group right now so you need to phosphorylate the end because otherwise the ligation would always work at the 5 prime of the phosphate group and the 3 prime hydroxyl group in between that it would create the phosphodiester bond so you need something to phosphorylate the pcr product which is generally done by polynucleotide kinase and thereby dephosphorylating the vector and phosphorylating the insert really increase the efficiency of the cloning and that's how it is super important in terms of cloning these days now it can be also used for end labeling purposes or labeling the dna with radioactive probes let's say so let's say here is a portion of the dna which we want to label we first use alkaline phosphatase to dephosphorylate the five prime ends or the five prime phosphates now we would rephosphorylate it with polynucleotide kinase now, using polynucleotide kinase, we can rephosphorylate it. But once we are using polynucleotide kinase, we can give give radio labeled 
nucleotides which would incorporate the label inside the DNA and the ends would be labeled right most of the cases in order to incorporate a radio label the radioactive ATP is used and that is how the end of the DNA is labeled by radio label P32 oftenly these strategy is used to make labeled probes for RNA in situ hybridization or probes for southern or northern blotting. Now, next, let's talk about a micrococcal nucleus, which is an endonuclease that preferentially digests a single stranded DNA or RNA, especially at AT or AU rich regions. So, you can clearly understand in order to get rid of single standard products like be it RNA, be it DNA, from a mixture of these things, we can use this particular uh, micrococcal nucleus, right? Now, that is how micrococcal nucleus is pretty handy in I mean, day to day molecular biology research. Then comes RNAs A, and this enzyme is not uncommon for us. RNAs A, as the name suggests, it would cleave RNA from a solution, right? If you have a solution which contains both DNA and RNA, RNAs would be totally degraded after using RNAs A, while the DNA, the double stranded DNA, are pretty much resistant. Now, this kind of strategy or RNAs A enzyme is mostly used mostly used in case of plasmid isolations. We'll discuss about it. But let's quickly look at how RNAs A enzyme work. RNAs A enzyme basically work by cleaving the phosphodiester bonds in between two nucleotides in the RNA. It forms a two, three cyclic nucleotide intermediate and thereby breaking the bond and freeing up a portion of the RNA. And that's how it works. So we don't focus on the mechanism in details, but let's just try to understand why it is so important. Because let's say you have isolated a plasmid, right? And you want to do all the downstream processing of the cloning from that particular plasmid. But while isolating the plasmid from the bacteria, you don't need a contamination of RNA in your sample. So you want to get rid of that RNA. In order to get rid of that RNA, you can use RNAs A enzyme, right? Similarly, there is another cousin of RNAs A, which is known as RNAs H. RNAs H is pretty specific because it can only target the RNAs which are in a RNA DNA hybrid format. Only it would cleave the RNA in an RNA DNA hybrid format, otherwise, it won't cleave the RNA. So especially this is super important for cDNA for cDNA making to get rid of the RNA DNA hybrid. Now DNS1, as the name suggests, it gets rid of DNA contamination from an RNA sample. Let's say you have isolated an RNA sample from a tissue and you want to do qPCR to understand gene expression changes, but you don't need genomic DNA contamination in that sample because while you make cDNA from the extracted RNA, the genomic DNA contaminant can give rise to non-specific amplification. That's why you need to get rid of the genomic DNA by DNAs and that would ensure the only amplification that happens happens from the cDNA, not the genomic DNA. That would give you fruitful results in your qPCR experiments. Next, we talk about reverse transcriptase, which is a RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So what it would do is reverse transcribe the RNA. It generally use a random hexamer primer or a oligodity primer and using that it synthesize another strand in this video we'll not talk about the mechanism by which cdna of synthesis takes place but we know that reverse transcriptase is super important to create complementary dna and it is super important in the workflow of transcriptomics so i hope you enjoyed this video if you like this video give it a quick thumbs up don't forget to like share and subscribe thank you